Jim, I was listening to the weather today, and the guy up in Cleveland says it's going to be 50 degrees tomorrow. I gotta, we, we got to be doing something with bees, right? Well, first of all, I had not heard that. I take that as good news. Yes, we got to be doing something with bees. You know, there's people in the country already in the warm places that have been doing things with bees already. They've got pollen coming in, and it looks like that even though winter's still here, the world's waking up. Yeah, a friend of mine sent me pictures of his bees visiting maple blossoms yesterday. So there are a bunch of people that are way ahead of us, but you and I, it's still, it's a co- it's a warm winter, but it's still winter yeah, out it, there, and snow is a likelihood, and cold weather is a likelihood, so what are we going to be doing tomorrow? Well, there's busy work things that need to be done, could be done, should be done, so let's talk about it for a while. Hi, I'm Kim Flottam. And I'm Jim Tew. Today on Honey Bee Obscura, we're going to be talking about one of the first warm days us northern folks have seen this spring. That should be enjoyable. You are listening to Honey Bee Obscura, brought to you by Growing Planet Media, the folks behind Beekeeping Today podcast. Each week on Honey Bee Obscura, hosts Kim Flottam and Jim Tu explore the complexities, the beauty, the fun, and the challenges of managing honeybees in today's world. Get ready for an engaging discussion to delight and inform all beekeepers. If you're a long timer or just starting out, sit back and enjoy the next several minutes as Kim and Jim explore all things honeybees. Okay, it's going to be 50. I'm going to wear a bee suit, but I don't have to wear a coat on You're optimistic. (laughs) So you think you're going to need a bee suit. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Why, do you find dead colonies to be particularly aggressive or what? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope no, not. I hope you have some alive. I, I had them alive a few a few weeks ago. I think they're still okay. I guess the first thing I'll do when I go out there is stand and watch and see if anybody's flying. I agree completely. The first thing you do, because those are the ones that's going to get the bulk of your attention. Yep. Got the three out there, and I go take a look. And I see one of them's flying, and there's bees sitting on the landing board of another one. And I don't know if they're coming out from that colony or if there's robbers going in from the colony that is flying, and I got one with no action at all. Yep. Given that scenario, what's the first thing you'd do? I I want to put my attention on those that I can decide quickly are alive. This is not advice, Kim. This is just me on that rare, warm day here in Northeast Ohio where you can actually do something with bees. So I want to put my attention on those that are, are alive. And I do simple things. Is, is the entrance reduced uh, opening still accessible for bees coming and going? Do I need to, to pull out the dead bees away from the entrance so that they have good, clear flight? Uh, that, that kind of thing. Well, they still have some weight about them. Even though it's really subjective, and I've had beekeepers attack me for it, I'd probably, while I'm pulling out those dead bees, heft that colony to see if it still has good weight about it. You just do a just do a, a quick heft? Yeah, I don't have scales of any kind. So maybe this year, Kim, I can do some of those modern things where you just use your phone to tell how much weight gain your colony has taken or lost. But I don't have that yet. So I still do the old-fashioned 1955, is it heavy or not? I think you're right there. Except, you know, I always go the opposite direction. I want to make sure that the one I think is dead is dead. So that if the one that I know is alive needs some help, there may be some resources I can pull out of that dead colony right now. Yep. I, I, I don't disagree with you on that, believe it or not. Because that's going to be the next thing I'm going to do. If I have an amazing moment and this colony is light and it's alive, then if I don't have honey on some of those dead outs, then I've got to go to this emergency, desperate, late winter, early spring feeding process. That always has mixed results, but it's it's something. Sometimes it helps. So I just do it the other way. But that is my second thing. Yeah. Uh, But I like your idea of, Making sure the 
entrance is clean because that could be a busting colony in there and then they can't get out. And if you open the door by getting rid of whatever's blocking it, suddenly you've got two live colonies out there instead yep. of one. Yeah, yep. that's a good idea. Kim, I didn't mean to go down this path, but I've stumbled into something. I, I've written an article for the American Bee Journal, and I told them that when you put that old-fashioned wooden entrance reducer in, that notch should be turned upward, not downward. And I've gotten four letters asking why. So in the article I just written, I told them why. When you take that wooden strip and you turn that notch down, and then you have maybe a significant bee die off, starving, disease, varroa up infected or whatever, and those bees drop to the bottom board in significant numbers, it's not impossible to, to block that entrance. So the old guy said if you turn that notch upward, then you've got about three-eighths of an inch of a, of a space for those dead bees to drop to, and the live bees still crawl over their fallen comrades to get out. So that's been a, a, an issue I didn't mean to be one. It's a tempest in a beekeeping teapot. The main thing is have an interest reducer in somewhere. But normally the notch when a perfect world would be turned upward, not downward, because of these dead bees dropping off. You know, that says something for an upper entrance. It says a lot for an upper yeah. entrance. I always provide one. Right now, an upper entrance, people are looking at twice because of the ventilation aspect of what happens if you provide a lot of ventilation in the winter uh, in that box. And, and if you don't, do you get... Warm air rising, hitting that inner cover, condensing and dripping back down on the bees. Or, yep. and and one of the things that we I ran into just recently, there was a, a hive designed by a fellow in England, uh, and his upper entrance is in the middle of the box, not the top. And he says that works. He's in the in the UK, and he says that works pretty good for him there. He doesn't get any condensation. And and if he gets a lot of snow, he's got an entrance, and it doesn't get blocked with dead bees and that uh, crowd out the fro you know, on the floor. Well, that's interesting. I, I have never heard that. I don't really uh, disagree with it. I just didn't <laughs> see that coming. I didn't either. Let's take a break and hear from our sponsor and let me think about it. Hi, we're starting the winter holiday celebrations. Nothing is better for a stocking stuffer, hostess gift, or party favor than honey, homemade hand cream, candles, or lip balm. If you want to learn how to craft these or other products of the hive, such as beeswax, you can visit betterbee.com for tips, tricks, and products made by love by you and your honeybees. So from all of us at Better Bee, we wish you wonderful winter holidays and terrific celebrations. Well, as far as it goes, we're putting the entrance, our UK friend, putting it in the middle. Okay, I, I, you know, at, at least at least they have a, a, an emergency exit if it's needed. So go ahead. I mean, no harm in trying. I'm not going to adapt this guy's... Um complete hive it's got some aspects of it that are that, that i don't particularly want to have to work with they're not bad it's just i'm i'm used to doing it a different way but uh, that middle entrance thing caught my attention and and uh you'll probably see some at some uh, attention given to that coming up yep. it's not available in the u.s you have to build it yourself I like the way you said that, that that's not something you do. Isn't it? It's painful to change, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, you got your way. Somebody's got their way, and I'm not changing. I've got my way. But, yeah, so I, let me think. I don't like auger holes, Cam. I'm off the subject. I don't care for auger holes. I've never liked those things. I, I would rather slip the equipment back on itself and leave a shallow opening along the front than to bore a hole in the equipment because invariably— I have to move that colony, and then there's that hole that's got to be plugged up. It's not a big deal, 
I just don't routinely bore auger holes. Yeah. Here comes the calls now. Get ready. Here comes all the auger hole people explaining why that's a good thing to do. Well, it is carefully, he says. It is more like a tree than a box if you put that opening yep. in the middle. And and there may be something there that, that we've overlooked. But getting back to that colony, um, I've determined that, let's just, let's just put it this way, one of them's really busy flying. They're just glad to be at, and they're out pooping in front of the colony like mad. And the other one is beginning to wake up, and one of them isn't. One of them is expired. It isn't here anymore. What do you do? Okay, so you say the first one you want to look at is the one you know is alive. So what are you looking for? What are you I'm, doing? I'm look that if, if it's alive, how much alive is it? Does it look like it's got a shot, or is this thing a cup of bees and a desperate queen? Because, Kim, there's still enough winter left that that colony's prognosis is not good. But if you look at a colony and there's a good bee population still there, and you think it's got a shot at making it till spring, then that's the one I'm going to put the resources on. So if I've got some honey left over in a dead out, I'll consolidate that. I want to center that brood nest up. I don't want to make a lot of major changes, but center that brood nest up in the equipment and then put that extra honey that I'm giving them right on top of that soon-to-be wintering cluster again because cold weather's coming back. It's not, it's not gone. So then what I'm left with then is a colony that has a chance, and I'll put that honey on top of it. So what happens to that small colony, hypothetically, that mm. That yeah. one that's not going to make it. Well, can I be blunt? It's dead. It just hasn't finished dying. So there's not not a lot you can do. All that newspaper and combining with something else, you really can't do that here in Northeast Ohio in the latter weeks of January. That's it's just not going to work out. There's just, just going to be hard to be a hero there. Maybe if you got three or four of these things, you could shake them all together. But if you're starting to do all this on that rare 50-degree day, you need to start just the time that temperature is up because those radical changes are going to require time and temperature for those bees to get repositioned into a cluster and then be ready for the cold to come back. It's, it's not going to be easy to help a small colony. Shoot a hole in that, Kim. Well, you just said of that strong colony, you're going to be centering the brood nest and then putting food on top. So when you're centering the brood nest on there, you're moving frames around? I'm moving frames over. I'm not moving them up and down that much. But if they're up against the side wall, I just want them over in the center. Okay. I don't want them against that side wall. But I'm, I'm not really moving frames up and down. So you're in there. You've got... You've got the top box off, or you've got the cover and inner cover off, depending on how many boxes. And you're putting smoke in that hive, and you're 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 consolidating whatever brood is in that box into the middle two, three, four, or five frames. I think so. Okay. <laughs> Was that a question or a statement? Well, I, I'm trying I'm trying to envision this because I've always been reluctant to move frames. I can see why you're doing it. It makes perfect sense is to get the bees and the food as close together as you can and then food above it because they're going to move up some more. But I've always been reluctant to move frames because tomorrow it's not going to be 50. It's going to be 30. And yep. the, the bees that are trapped, that get, that get abandoned over on that edge frame, aren't going to be able to get back to the middle, are they? Well, I moved them. So they're not going to be on that edge frame. But you're making a deal out of this. I didn't mean to be a deal. So, <laughs> yes, number one, I feel your reluctance. Number two, work quickly and get out of there because this is this is a little island of weather that's not going to last. So don't, don't start a major bee operation. That's why I said the prognosis of that small colony is not good. But if they're up, if there's if there's four frames, five frames of bees, and they're kind of over on those four frames against a wall, I'm just going to pull out maybe the other four frames and then slip everything over toward the center so that it's centered. But I'm not really pulling frames out. I'm not looking for queen patterns. 
I'm not doing anything like that because every bee that leaves that hive, can I say that there's probably a 40 or 50 percent chance at least that it's not going to find that colony again? They're going to be out buzzing around even at 45, 50 degrees. They're going to become chill, disoriented, not get back. So it's easy to do more harm than good. So work quickly. Make your changes. Colony is alive. It looks like it's got a chance of making it. Needs some honey. Here's some honey. I'll put it here. And then close it up and go. Because they've got to get back into that cluster form for the for the afternoon weather when it drops back down to 42 that night, 30, or even colder, depending on the forecast. They've got to recluster. So don't work them till 4.30 in the afternoon and give them no time to recover to what you've done to them. That, that makes sense. And 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 you're coming and cleaning up the bottom board, no matter what kind of reducer you got in there. Well, you know, you got the notch up. Uh, but but some kind of twig or something that you can get in there and scoop out all those all the dead bees that you've got in there. Uh, clean that up. That'll help get the make sure the entrance reducer is in the right way and it's going to stay there, that it's stuck in there, not loose. And get the bees in the best place in the box. I guess that makes... Uh, why Why hasn't a beekeeper, out of all that beekeepers have invented, why hasn't anyone ever made a gadget for pulling those dead bees out? Because I use a twig. Yeah. I use a hive tool as far as it'll reach. But there is no dead bee removal brush that I know of. Now, maybe I've overlooked something because there's so many new things out there. But you, one would think that there'd be some way to clean those bees out expeditiously and then be done with it rather than twig. Here's this twig. This will work. Oh, here's another twig that won't work. <laughs> That's t- twigs are a lot like hive top rocks, aren't they? You know, a beehive doesn't come with a hive top rock. You have to go find one to keep the lid from blowing off. It is the cheapest piece of beekeeping equipment you'll ever own that rock yep yep <laughs> that's right a hive twig <laughs> well i guess i'm i guess i'm ready for 50 degrees tomorrow i'm looking forward to it i'll probably need boots because there'll be standing water out there uh underneath my hive stand but uh, that's why they're on a hive stand and that opening comment where you and i chatted for a bit we mentioned people who are far ahead of us So if they're sitting there now listening to their car radio or whatever, and in your deep south, I mean, you've got pollen coming in. So you can you can forget this hive twig business and and interest reducers. You're well beyond that. So those beekeepers need to be looking at reversing brood boxes to be sure that developing brood nest already has two boxes to lay in and already thinking about swarm prevention. They can already uh, kiss off any kind of pollen substitute addition too late. You miss that window because they're bringing in natural pollen now. So for that group of people in warm climates, essentially the spring season's here. So get on with that considerably ahead of what we're doing here, Kim. Yeah. In a way, I'm jealous of that. I'd like it to be 70 tomorrow, but I don't want it to be 110 in July. So. That's true. <laughs> when you said that, I was thinking, yeah, but those beekeepers in warm climates, they, they have to work a lot longer than we do. Yep. They're yep. out there on the job already, and you and I are still drinking warm coffee looking out the window on a snowy day. Well, I'm going to keep doing that today. I'm glad I, I'm glad I brought this up because you brought up some good things that I'm going to have to look at tomorrow. I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Well, you've guilted me into going out and looking at my own, so I'll I'll go out too. I didn't know the weather was coming. You know the the weather predictors are a nice beekeeping tool, and they don't get credit for it. You're right. It was only it was only a few decades ago that no offense to the weather predicting people, but they weren't always right. But they're pretty much on the money now. So that's a handy B2 just to watch the Weather Channel. Yep. yep. Well, I'm going to go watch the Weather Channel some more, I think, and get ready for uh, going out and looking at my bees tomorrow. All right. Let's have a good All day. Right. Be refreshing. Spring is here, Kim. It just doesn't look like <laughs> it. All right. Bye-bye.